Welcome everybody to the conference. This is our 2014 National Directors Institute web conference series and we're in our 13th annual season of a program which we started in 2002. As with our NDI programs in past years, we are looking forward to sharing the insights and experiences on corporate governance issues that we think matter most to you. The goals and objectives of our NDI program have always been to provide practical insights and useful takeaways to directors, executives, and boardroom advisors. Materials for our previous NDI webinars, other sessions, and other sessions including PowerPoint presentations and audio recordings are available on our dedicated NDI website, which is foley.com forward slash NDI. Information regarding future NDI webinar sessions will be found on our NDI website as well. We held our in-person 2013 NDI Executive Exchange in Chicago on November 13th. Please go to our NDI website to find many valuable program materials from that all-day program. Our next invitation-only in-person NDI Executive Exchange will be held Thursday, November 6, 2014, so be on the lookout for more information. I'd like the opportunity to thank all of our NDI co-sponsors, many of whom have been supportive to NDI for years, and some who are new to our program this year. Aon Corporation, Beal & Associates, D.F. King & Company, Eversheds, Global Governance Advisors, and Morgan Stanley, as well as our in-kind sponsors, Diversity in Boardrooms, and Inforum Board Access. Today our program is entitled, Our Boards of Directors, the New Target and Data Breaches. With us today is Ethan Lenz. Ethan is a partner in Foley's insurance and reinsurance industry team, focusing his practice on providing risk management and insurance-related advice to many of the firm's commercial clients, including advice on director and officer liability coverage and a wide variety of other commercial and professional insurance programs. Also with us today is Kevin Kalinich. Kevin leads Aon's global practice to identify exposures and develop insurance solutions related to the technology errors and omissions, miscellaneous professional liability, media liability, network risk, and intellectual property. Finally, we have Ross Wheeler. Ross serves as the co-leader for the central region, which consists of brokerage teams in Minneapolis and Chicago. The region represents a diverse portfolio of clients, including Fortune 500 companies, plus other complex placements, including IPOs, M&A, distressed and bankruptcy, foreign domiciled, and financial institutions. Before beginning our discussion, a few housekeeping items. Today's program will last approximately one hour. The PowerPoint presentation will be available on our website at foley.com forward slash NDI by early next week, or simply click the download a copy of files box along the right-hand right side of your screen. If you experience problems with Adobe Connect, please call 888-569-3948 for technology assistance. For audio assistance, dial star then zero on your telephone to reach an operator. Today's program has been set up in both a discussion and interactive question and answer forum. We encourage you to submit written questions during the program. Type your question into the Q&A box at the right side of the presentation slides. We will respond to written questions at the end of the program, time permitting. If we do not have time for Q&A at the end of the program, we will be sure to follow up with you offline. To ensure you get the most out of today's presentation, we encourage all participants to maximize the PowerPoint to full screen usage. You can do so by clicking the full screen button located above the slides. As a reminder, today's program is being recorded and will be available on Foley's website by early next week. Foley will apply for CLE credit after the web conference. If you did not supply your CLE information upon registration, please send an email to Jennifer Bartz at jbartz at foley.com. And please note, those seeking Kansas, New York, and or New Jersey CLE credit are required to complete the attorney affirmation form. A four-digit code will be announced during the presentation. Email the code to jbarts at foley.com to get a copy of the form or simply click the download, to download the form from the files box along the right side of your screen to get a copy right now. Also note that you must log into both audio and video to obtain CLE credit. And finally, it can take up to six to eight weeks for us to obtain all CLE approvals, and we appreciate your patience in this process. And now I would like to turn the presentation over to Kevin Kalinich from Aon. 
according to accounting firm Eisner Amper, in its recently released fifth annual survey of directors titled Concerns About Risks Confronting Boards, cybersecurity IT risk has risen to the second highest area of risk management that are important to the board at 62% of the respondents. So what does that mean in terms of which entities should be concerned? What is the financial impact of the concern? Is there insurance that could cover these concerns? And how do the cyber exposures and solutions compare on an enterprise risk management level to other exposures such as property and casualty? If you take a look at the typical entity today, slowly but surely, they have been increasing their usage in two areas, technology and information assets. And the growth of technology and information assets is expected to continue at an astronomical pace. The first tip today is that embracing these new technologies and information assets does not necessarily mean that your exposures are worse. It means they're different. Take the example of cloud computing. If manufacturer of widgets, company XYZ, manufactures widgets but is trying to also keep up to date with the latest and greatest in servers and IT security, it is conducting its IT security as an ancillary secondary business to its main business of manufacturing widgets. However, what if the company XYZ outsourced its IT and IT security to a third party that spent 24-7, 365 perfecting the IT security? In many instances, the outsourcing of technology can actually improve risk management. Are there any exposures left, though, after outsourcing? Well, recent developments um, have taught us that there can be catastrophic losses, and the catastrophic losses are not limited to retail entities, but could also be in healthcare, education, uh, hospitality, manufacturing, um, and other type of uh, industries. The um, industries that have most purchased uh, cyber insurance to this point are financial institutions primarily because they have been scrutinized by regulators longer than other entities, and tech and communications and healthcare and retail who have suffered an inordinate amount of losses um, compared to their total um, contribution to the GDP. The losses can be calculated by number of records exposed, defense costs, forensics costs, notification of um, aggrieved um, consumers. And you can take a look at what your own uh, number of records and type of records are to, to kind of give you a guideline as to what your potential exposures might be based on similarly situated entities that have suffered losses. The most Forward-thinking entities are recognizing that the increased use of technology and information assets is changing their exposures. And they're recognizing this by disclosure in their um, 10-K statements. So if you take a, a close look at recent 10-K statements, the first thing you notice is that they like to differentiate themselves from their competitors in similarly situated entities by describing how they're embracing technology and information assets in a more beneficial manner. Then the converse is that is they also must disclose that this new embracing of technology and information assets is creating exposures that could result in material impact to their financial statements. And what type of material impact are we talking about? Well, once the incident occurs, there are 47 states that require disclosure of the incident. Shortly thereafter, the plaintiff's attorneys will file a lawsuit and um, 
there's defense and indemnity costs. But another more recent development in the past few years is that the shareholders of the entity start to attack the directors for breach of fiduciary duty, accusing the directors of not satisfying their duties in uh, appropriating the resources to IT security for financial statement protection, including appropriate levels of insurance protection. So I think that at this point, we need to start digging in what are the sources of claims after a cyber incident? What are those sources that could cause the lawsuits and the stock drop and the derivative shareholder class actions? Thanks, Kevin. This is uh, Ethan Lenz from Foley. And um, I wanted to talk, spend just a little bit of time talking about some of the various areas, sources of claims uh, that we're seeing following a security or privacy incident, and then also spend a little bit of time um, with an overview of some of the things that particularly directors of companies should be thinking about in terms of, well, if we do have a security or privacy incident, um, do we have insurance that will protect, potentially protect the company assets for these claims that might come about? So. Some of the areas uh, that are most likely to generate claims are some of the uh, persons and entities that are most likely to generate claims. First of all, the customers who are impacted, uh, particularly if uh, companies' systems are hacked and personal financial or other uh, private personal information is lost as a result of that, uh, more than likely there will be customer claims against the company. Now, most of the claims by the customers, more than likely, they are going to be focused against the company, naming the company as a defendant, as opposed to individual directors and officers. Some of the things those customers are likely to be looking for, um, cost to cover, the, uh, to cover credit monitoring following a loss of their financial information. Also, plaintiff's attorneys are getting more and more creative and coming up with various damage theories. Um, traditionally, this has been an area that's been a bit difficult for the plaintiff's bar, but they are coming up with theories in terms of uh, damages that might arise from um, invasion of privacy, damages, the direct damages, obviously, that arise when you are dealing with financial information and there's been unauthorized use of uh, customer credit card information and such. Second area of potential claims are, as Kevin had talked about just a few minutes ago, shareholders. A couple of different areas where shareholders or a couple of different ways that shareholders might bring claims, particularly against a publicly traded company. To date, the big security breaches that we've heard about, the Targets, the Wyndhams, uh, now the Home Depot, um, are, largely, are largely leading to claims from shareholders um, on the derivative side. Basically, a derivative action, it's an action brought by the shareholders on behalf of the company against individual directors and officers. Usually the claims are uh, in the area of some type of an allegation that the directors and officers breach their duty to either institute um, or oversee appropriate safeguards uh, with respect to the information security systems and practices of the company and as a result, the company has suffered the damages, the damages being all of these claims that are coming in against the company at this point. Uh, the second area of potential shareholder claims, which we haven't seen quite as much activity. I, I don't know if with the, the large security breaches, actually, I don't think there have been any yet, uh, but are likely on the horizon will be direct shareholder class actions. Um, this is going to happen if there's a stock price drop following the security incident. And more than likely, the types of claims you're going to see here are going to be claims um, alleging failures to properly disclose in the SEC disclosures, um, failure to disclose the risks associated with the information security practices and procedures of the company. Third area of potential claims are regulatory agencies. 
Um, so far, again, with the uh, large security breaches we've all heard about, uh, the FTC has been the most active regulatory agency out there prosecuting claims. And uh, basically, their claims um, are typically based on allegations that the company failed to observe or implement adequate security practices, which in turn give rise to an unfair and deceptive business practice because the company didn't use commercially reasonable efforts to affect its privacy, its written privacy policies. Um, that, that's been the major source of attack by regulatory agencies so far. Um, another area that, again, likely, you know, or potentially at least on the horizon, the SEC uh, could be a potential claimant. And, uh, you know, the claims there being, again, again, arising from the 10K disclosures and such, uh, some type of claim that those, those disclosures were either inaccurate or inadequate. Last area of potential claims that uh, we're mostly seeing are some other third parties, and particularly financial institutions, when you are dealing with a security incident involving loss of customer financial data, particularly credit cards. And the financial institutions, um, again here, their claims are usually focused on the company as a defendant as opposed to individual directors and officers, but essentially the claims that they are bringing are claims where they're looking to recover the fraud-related costs that they've incurred because their customers have had an unauthorized use of their credit card information. So with that in mind, the, the sources of claims, um, one of the things that directors and officers need to be thinking about is, well, how does our current insurance coverage protect us in the event that we do suffer a security incident? And there are at least three potential um, coverages that should be looked at fairly carefully to determine whether or not the company has uh, adequate, if any, insurance protection against these potential types of claims. First area is commercial general liability insurance. Commercial general liability insurance is, you know, it's usually sort of the backbone of uh, the liability protection that a company has, but it's somewhat limited coverage. Essentially, your commercial general liability coverage is slip and fall coverage for uh, people who get hurt on the premises of the company. If you're a manufacturer, it's going to provide you with your product liability coverage. And then it's also going to provide some additional what is defined in the policy as personal injury protection, which includes uh, some protection for damages arising from alleged invasion of privacy. Now, with that said, there are some very significant limitations on the potential commercial general liability coverage for damages arising from a security incident. First one is, well, the, the first half of your commercial general liability policy is going to provide coverage for what are called bodily injury and property damage. The company is sued for bodily injury or property damage. The commercial general liability policy, at least initially, should respond. Well, when you're dealing with a security incident, um, unlikely that you're going to have bodily injury claims. So your bodily injury coverage, unlikely to be triggered. Property damage, a little bit more of a question mark, but there are serious limitations on the property damage coverage with respect to electronic data and, therefore, coverage for security-related incidents. Problems there are that typically, uh, under the standard form, and commercial general liability policies are almost all written on a quite standard form of coverage, um, the property damage definition specifically uh, limits the coverage to damage to liability or damage to, per to tangible property. In damage to intangible property, read data, is typically not covered under the commercial general liability policy. Uh, other thing you run into on the property damage side is that electronic data is also typically specifically excluded um, from the definition of property damage under the policy. 
So that brings you to the other side of the policy, which is that personal injury protection that I'd mentioned um, earlier. Personal injury protection also has fairly severe limitations when it comes to a security incident type claim. Uh, the main area where you potentially might trigger coverage is coverage for the publication of material that violates a person's right of privacy. The issue here when you're dealing with security incidents and the large ones that we've seen recently is that there usually is no publication of material by the company. And what I mean by that is um, when you look at the large security incidents we're seeing, um, they are usually the result of hackers breaking into the company's system and stealing the data. The company hasn't made any publication of uh, material that invades the person's right of privacy. The area where some companies have had uh, a little bit of success in getting coverage under the personal injury side of the, pol of the CGL policy is uh, in instances where companies have printed credit card information on receipts or invoices, things of that nature. There, there's a much better argument that the company actually was involved in publication of the material, therefore potentially triggering coverage under the personal injury side of the policy. So very limited, or likely very limited protection for uh, claims from security instances, uh, incidents under your commercial general liability. On top of that, um, this summer, the Insurance Services Office, which is the company that primarily writes the standard form general liability policies, has introduced new endorsements that attempt to exclude all coverage for claims arising from access to or disclosure of confidential or personal information. They want to get coverage for security inc incidents, cyber events, out of the general liability policies. Their argument being that this is a more, quote, traditional type of insurance policy. It's written to provide the on-premises coverage, the product's liability type coverage, there is other coverage available to companies if they want to specifically cover events um, like the cyber liability or security incidents. So again, commercial general liability, probably very limited coverage for um, your cyber events. Second area or the second type of coverage that potentially will provide some protection for cyber related events is your director's and officer's liability insurance. And here, um, the most likely types of claims to be covered are those from shareholders, potentially those from customers, potentially some coverage for claims brought by regulatory agencies, uh, and possibly those other third parties, those financial institutions. Um, but you have to carefully analyze how the coverage works under the DNO policy. So your DNO policy, it's going, to it's going to provide two basic forms of protection. One's going to be coverage for individual directors and officers. Individual directors and officers are named as defendants in a suit. That's where the DNO policy typically kicks in. Other coverage of the DNO policy is separate coverage for the company itself, the company gets named as a defendant in a lawsuit. The DNO policy potentially protects the company against its liability as well. So starting out, uh, the coverage for actions against individual directors and officers. Well, those shareholder claims, those derivative actions, the, sharehold, the potential shareholder class actions, um, more than likely, the, these are going to fall into the area of your prototypical DNO covered claim, barring uh, any specific uh, cyber type exclusion that the DNO insurer has added to the policy. These should be covered. Now, with respect to that cyber security incident type exclusion, haven't seen a lot of that in the DNO policies yet. But the DNO insurers are obviously, they're very cognizant of the large security breaches that have taken place, particularly over the last year. They're looking at this very closely. 
and uh, there is some concern that down the road they may start adding these exclusions. In fact, uh, if you're a healthcare entity, you may already have these in your policy. There are some insurers who are specifically adding specific exclusions for cyber-related events to healthcare uh, entities' policies. But again, individual directors and officers named as defendants, derivative actions, shareholder class actions, typically should be covered under your DNO policy. Regulatory agency claims, um, there, again, as I'd mentioned earlier, FTC has been the most active uh, regulatory agency out there prosecuting claims against companies after a security incident. Those claims so far have largely been directed only against the company and are not specifically naming individual directors and officers as defendants. So may not trigger the individual director and officer coverage of the policy. Other limitation you'll run into if and when individual directors do get named in a claim by a regulatory agency is that typically in order to trigger coverage under the DNO policy for an individual director and officer for regulatory type action, the director and officer either needs to be named in a subpoena or be specifically named as the target of the regulatory agency's investigation. Um, you know, the most uh, likely example of that is a Wells notice from the SEC. A lot of times, informal inquiries where information is requested from directors and officers, um, if the director and officer has not yet been specifically named as a target of the investigation, those informal inquiries and the expenses related to them won't be covered under the DNO policy. Um, the claims by the other third parties, the financial institutions, again, those have been directed so far to uh, naming the companies as defendants in the lawsuits and therefore typically aren't going to trigger any coverage for the individual directors and officers simply because they're not defendants um, in those lawsuits. <clears throat> now, when you get to the other side of the DNO policy, um, the coverage for the company itself you run into a little bit of a split in how these policies are work, uh, how these policies work, depending on whether the company is publicly traded or it's a non-public, privately held company. If you are a publicly traded company, usually the coverage for the company itself, when it is named as a defendant, is limited to coverage for securities-related claims. So. Shareholder class action, against usually that's going to name both individual directors and officers and the company as a defendant, um, that will likely be covered under your DNO policy. Where you're going to run into issues with a publicly traded company DNO policy and a claim against the company is when you're dealing with some of these other uh, claims, claims by financial institutions trying to recover their fraud-related costs likely not covered under the, under the public company DNO policy. Reason being, that's not a securities claim against the company. It's an other type of claim. Regulatory agency claims, um, again, these FTC claims that we're seeing, those are not securities related claims, likely not covered under the, publicly, under the public company DNO policy. Um, now, if you are not a public, if your company is not a publicly traded company, the DNO protection is actually much broader for the company itself when it's named as a defendant. Typically covers any alleged wrongful act, which is any error, omission, or act by the company. You, there, you potentially have coverage now for claims by financial institutions. You potentially have claims for you potentially have coverage for claims by regulatory agencies. The thing you have to watch out for on the non-public uh, company DNO policies, though, is a lot of times there will be a very broad antitrust and unfair or deceptive trade practice exclusion on the policy, or sometimes a sublimit of coverage. So you might have a five million dollar overall uh, policy limit but a $1 million sublimit for unfair and deceptive trade practice uh, type claim. And there, that exclusion or that sublimit can kick in and either 
completely knock out or at least deplete the coverage for um, the for for the company for those uh, FTC type claims. Um, so at this point, what I want to do is uh, I'm going to turn it over to Ross, and Ross is going to take you a little more in depth on some of the specific DNO claims issues that arise with these types of incidents. Thanks, Ethan. Again, good morning or good afternoon. It's, it's Ross Wheeler. I'm going to spend the next few minutes just dissecting a derivative claim in a little bit more detail. It's, it's a type of claim that's been discussed a few times by, by Ethan and, and Kevin. Um, and, and from my perspective, from what I've seen, it, it's, it's definitely the most talked about DNO implication as it relates to a data breach, and, and we, we've seen some claim activity uh, specific to um, derivative claims. It's, it's also of particular relevance for today's discussion. Obviously, the, the title of this session is our board of directors, the new target in data breaches, and in essence, a derivative claim definitely targets, uh, you know, individual Ds and Os. And so a quick, a quick refresher. Uh, derivative action is a lawsuit that's, in essence, initiated by corporate shareholders. It's brought by the company against the director's officers and management of the corporation for failure to, to manage. In essence, the thought process here is that the balance sheet has been harmed and it's holding, you know, the individuals accountable. In terms of the process or the procedure, a demand is initially filed by a shareholder requesting the board to bring a civil proceeding. So what the, what the company does is typically they'll form a special litigation committee. The board will investigate the, the merits of, of, that, uh, of that allegation um, and determine ultimately whether it's in the best interest of the company to, to bring litigation. Again, remember the thought process being the balance sheet has been harmed and so any recovery that comes from that, uh, that litigation reimburses the balance sheet for, for uh, the harm that's been caused. Uh, there are definitely significant costs associated with these special litigation committees, some of which are definitely insurable under DNO policy. Um, so ultimately, if there's any merit to that, uh, to that complaint, then the claim is brought. Um, in, in a minute, I'll discuss coverage implications, but, but what's most concerning for individual Ds and Os is that typically derivative claims are not indemnifiable. Um, and, and to take that a step further, derivative settlements are typically not indemnifiable, subject to individual state law on indemnification. And so Delaware, you know, I just dissected this because it's one of the more common states of incorporation. Delaware allows for indemnification defense costs, but not settlement amounts. Um, with that being said, Delaware Code does permit for the insuring of judgments or amounts paid. So basically, um, you know, if there's a settlement or a judgment, asset of insurance would be the personal assets of the Ds and Os that are responding. So, so the next slide is a quick case study, um, and really here's what to expect from a DNO perspective in the event of a data breach. What we typically see, what we have seen, is allegations, which include breach of fiduciary duty, and, and more specifically, wasting of corporate assets. And I'll define that in a bit, um, but, um, but the, these, these types of claims are, are targeted at individuals. So we, we typically see, uh, you know, CEO, CIO function. And then um, we also see, see lead independent director named as a defendant and other individual directors. Um, Ethan had mentioned, you know, the, the, uh, the other concern, which would be a shareholder class action claim. And, and in some cases, you know, either there's a threat of litigation or we have seen litigation um, related to uh, basically a stock drop associated with that data breach. And, and the, the allegations are that these and those violated federal securities laws by failing to disclose. And, and I think what, what the SEC is really focused on and what Wall Street's been focused on is the timeliness of the disclosure. And so if you think back at, you know, some of the headlines we've seen, um, you, you know, there, there's typically a, a, a lag or a delay in terms of when the, when the incident was first discovered and ultimately when that was disclosed. And I know that the SEC, this is kind of an evolving topic, uh, but they previously issued some guidance and certain security breaches require mandatory SEC disclosure requirements. So, he, you know, this is, um, I think Kevin had mentioned earlier, risk factors, and, and this takes it a step further. And, and, and you know, we're starting to see uh, in, in 10 Ks uh, companies specifically reference, um, you know, um, data breaches and, and, and citing that as a risk factor. And this is a, you know, real-life uh, example here. It's, it's um, ex 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 um, excerpted from uh, a recent 10 K filing from a company we're all familiar with. Um, but it's interesting. I mean, basically, they're disclosing to Wall Street and to their investors uh, the fact that, th that they do deem this to be a significant issue and a significant concern. I highlighted here, you know, something that's of particular relevance where they, they say, if we experience a significant data security breach or failure to detect and appropriately respond to a significant data security breach, we could be exposed to government enforcement actions and private litigation. They go on to say, you know, it could hurt our reputation, increase labor costs, 
affect how we operate our business. Um, so uh, again, remember here that, that with a derivative claim, the argument that the balance sheet's been been harmed. You know, we see this type of disclosure. It's it's, it's very industry specific. Some industries are higher risk. Kevin mentioned FI, communication, healthcare, retail. Those are the industries that uh, we're seeing the most disclosure. Um, so in terms of what you know, what we see in terms of damages alleged. Um, you know, here's what the what the plaintiffs are are alleging in terms of uh, waste of corporate assets. Um, and again, you know, the allegation would be failure to supervise, failure to manage. Uh, had this data breach not occurred, you know, these costs never would have been incurred. So here's an example of, of some of the, the different types of expenses uh, from a DNO perspective that we see in a derivative claim: costs incurred from defending and paying any settlement in consumer class action filed against the company. So Again, you're, you're responding to other litigation, and obviously those costs can be significant. Uh, we also see uh, allegations or damages alleged for regulatory investigations in the data breach, uh, you know, including not, li not limited to liability for any potential fines. So whether it's the FTC or the SEC, fines associated with that, but more importantly, the actual investigation that, that, that happens. Um, the company itself does its own investigation. This is probably the most significant cost, the biggest bucket in terms of, of uh, you know, the, the allocation of, of financial resources. So the company will investigate the, the data breach. Uh, they, they incur significant expenses for legal investigative and consulting fees associated with that. Obviously, remediation activities. So once, you know, once the situation is under control, the company then needs to respond and, and expend, uh, you, know, um, um, you know, capital investment towards um, uh, remediation. The company, in some instances, has to fulfill its promise to provide credit monitoring. And probably most significantly is loss of revenue, where you know there's you know Wall Street um, reacts um, you know um, unfavorably and is concerned that uh, that the reputation's been damaged and that the sales will suffer as a result. So the, the last couple of slides, these are more you know from a um, as it relates to you know the DNO um, underwriting process as well as the you know the DNO policy response. You know we're starting to see more inquiries from underwriters specific to cybersecurity and cyber breach. Uh, this is, you know, becoming a, a, um, a regular topic in underwriting meetings. Um, you know, some may remember back in the year 2000, you know, Y2K, that was, you know, um, we would incur or, or experience a significant questioning uh, along those lines. And so, you know, what I did here is just jotted down some of the more common inquiries we've seen. Um, you know, the first three are proactive. The, the last one's more of a reactive uh, inquiry. But first and foremost, you know, there, there's inquiry on specific risk factor disclosure. So step one, would be to you know take a look at your own 10K or, or, or your peers or your competitors, see what they're disclosing, and, and be prepared to comment on that. Um, you know there's there's definitely inquiry about that council's been involved in the review process. Um, you know we're seeing inquiry about controls around cybersecurity, how much attention and investment this matter receives within the company. In a few instances, we've seen the CIO, uh, you know, participate in, in in underwriting discussions specific to this topic. And then the reactive question is, you know, definitely inquiry about the incident response and crisis management program. So, you know, if an incident happens, you know, how does the board respond? How does the company respond? And again, this kind of gets at mitigating the total costs incurred, you know, after the fact. Um, so, you know, specific to public company uh, considerations, Ethan hit on this a bit, um, but I really wanted to summarize some, some key points here. Um, again, with, with, you know, as it, as it applies to coverage for the entity, um, if there is a corresponding securities claim, and, and, and you know, then, then that portion of coverage is triggered for the entity, the entity itself would not qualify for coverage if, uh, if, if it finds itself subject to um, an investigation. With that being said, there is investigative coverage that will apply for the individual. So, for example, the CEO, the CIO, if they find themselves uh, being investigated individually, uh, then uh, the policy should respond you know, subject to the, the certain triggers. Um, I, I wanted to make this point that the derivative claim absolutely triggers coverage. Uh, you know, th there's a lot of inquiry about, um, you know, what happened from a DNO perspective, and, and there, there's no, at this point in time, there's no exclusion or no restriction as it relates to, uh, you know, a derivative claim arising from a, a data breach uh, that would uh, impact coverage. Now, there are issues potentially with the definition of loss and other areas that may impact, you know, what's subject to reimbursement, but the claim itself will absolutely trigger coverage. So again, I talked about you know fines and penalties that would typically fall outside the scope of coverage. Um, you know bodily injury, property damage exclusion. We don't see this much in the public company space, but like Ethan mentioned, you know you definitely want to make sure there's no privacy exclusion. You know the professional services exclusion. We see this on a case by case basis. It's it's really more industry specific. 
Um, it's not standard, but, but if, if coverage is subject to a professional services exclusion, what we would recommend is, to, you know, a couple carve-outs. One would be a securities claim uh, carve-out, including derivative claims. So basically, you know, the insurer can't trigger that exclusion if, it, if, there's a, if, if the claim is brought in the manner of a securities claim or a derivative claim. And also, you know, we, we see an exception or want to see an exception for side A claims, not indemnifiable claims. And so that's where the side A DIC policy, to a certain extent, may also kind of complement, uh, you know, the, the underlying coverage. Uh, and again, especially for claims against individuals, which a derivative claim is, uh, the side A DIC policy could be triggered as well. With that, I was going to turn it over to Jennifer for a quick housekeeping comment, and then uh, we'll continue from there. Thanks, Ross. For so those seeking CLE credit, please enter the following four-digit code into the CLE credit box that should now be appearing on your screen. The code is E-U-M-S, that's E as in echo, U as in uniform, M as in Mike, and S as in Sierra. Additionally, those seeking Kansas, New Jersey, or New York CLE credit are required to use the same four-digit code to complete the attorney affirmation form. The code is E-U-M-S, that's E as in echo, U as in uniform, M as in Mike, and S as in Sierra. To obtain a copy of the attorney affirmation form, download it from the files box at the right-hand side of your screen or email Jennifer Bartz at jbartz at folia.com. This concludes our CLE announcement. Ross, over to you. Oh, I'm sorry, Ethan. Yep, actually, it's going to be Ethan jumping back on here. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, so, what, so we've uh, been talking about the uh, potential sources of claims and uh, the potential sources of insurance protection that might be available out there, particularly the commercial general liability and uh, the D&O policy. The third area of potential insurance coverage is if the company carries specific cyber liability related insurance policy. It carries a cyber liability related insurance policy. Um, here in terms of these third party claims, uh, your most likely sources of coverage are going to be for uh, claims by customers or those financial institutions um, and, for, and potentially for claims by regulatory agencies. And some of the potential coverage you're going to get under a cyber liability policy um, might be, uh, first of all, the breach notification and credit monitoring. As Kevin had mentioned early on, there are, uh, I think it's 47 states out there right now that require uh, notification to customers and other affected individuals following a breach incident. Um, so the notification requirements in compiling who needs to be notified, how that notice needs to take place, when it needs to be sent, um, all of those related expenses, those can mount fairly heavily uh, quickly. And uh, then typically the other response of most companies, it's required in some states, uh, not required in others, but uh, usually part of the response if there's a large uh, if there's a large security incident, is to provide the customers with credit, or credit monitoring services. Um, those types of, of uh, costs, the breach notification, the credit monitoring, usually very unlikely to get coverage for those under your D&O policy. The reason being is those are usually proactive steps that, proactive though very expensive oftentimes, steps that the company is going to take um, before claims are actually made by the customers. Well, if you don't have a claim already made, your DNO policy isn't going to cover it. That's where your cyber liability can potentially come in uh, because it will cover these types of pre-claim uh, notification and monitoring costs. Uh, other specific coverage you get is for um, is the coverage for liab liability for disclosures. Again. Um, for those um, for, for those claims that might be brought by customers um, or by the financial institutions, usually going to be focused with the company as the named defendant. Publicly traded company, no coverage under the DNO policy. 
will likely have to look for any coverage under your cyber liability policy. Um, last area of what I'll call true liability type protection under the typical cyber liability policy is regulatory actions. Um, here, most cyber liability policies at least offer an option to cover, to provide coverage for regulatory related actions. Again, very important um, if this is a risk that the company has determined should be covered by insurance and it's a publicly traded company, um, very important that this be in your cyber liability policy because, again, FTC so far has been the most active agency not a securities related claim you're not going to have coverage for the company under the DNO policy have to look to the cyber liability policy um, for potential coverage now as Ross had mentioned with uh, the regulatory actions under the DNO policy usually to the extent there is any coverage for actions against individual directors and officers there's usually also an exclusion for fines and penalties you will often find that in the cyber liability policy as well Although with that said, um, these policies are not standardized at all. Um, every company writes them on their own paper. Sometimes you will be able, to, you will find, or you'll be able to negotiate uh, some coverage, usually limited for fines and penalties, at least to the extent that uh, indemnification by an insurer is not prohibited by law for the fines and penalties. This next slide, um, I think th this is a slide that Aon provided. I think it's a very good slide with respect to the scope of potential coverage under a cyber liability policy. And the, the thing to, one of the things with cyber liability policies is these are typically what I call menu-driven policies. You, they, there are a number of different potential coverages provided under the policy and a company can pick and choose which ones they actually want to buy. And so you may buy some of them, you may not buy others, you might buy all of them. Um, but this slide, what it does, if you start from the left, it starts out with your liability protection. What protections do you have for those claims brought by the outside third party? You can pick and choose among these in many of the policies. If you move to the middle section then, this is what you know, everybody in the insurance industry at least calls first-party protection. This is coverage for the company's own direct damages that it suffers as a result of a security incident. Uh, incident. And here you're looking at coverage for things like business interruption, um, extra expenses that might be incurred as a result of the incident, uh, reputation-type damages that might be suffered. Then the third area, as you move to the right on the slide, are um, the expense-related coverage. Things like crisis management, upfront costs to uh, retain a crisis management firm to help the company uh, with dealing with notificate with uh, the sort of outward-facing uh, PR with respect to the security incident. Uh, this is where you'll, co you'll find coverage for the breach notification, the credit monitoring, uh, may be able to get some coverage for the forensic investigation type of, uh, uh, of expenses that might be incurred. And um, one thing to keep in mind also with the cyber liability coverages is you, you, when you're looking at these policies or asking questions about these policies, one of the questions you have to ask is, okay, how do the limits of a policy work? And they might work different depending on which insurer is issuing the policy. They might work different from one policy issued to one company to another by the same insurer. And, and a couple of examples on that. Um, you might have separate limits of liability applicable to each of those different coverages under the liability section of the policy. You might have $1 million for something arising from the failure of network security. Um, you might have $500,000 for a regulator investigation. On top of that, there might be an overall policy aggregate limit that could kick in so that if you had that $1 million for network security, $500,000 for the regulatory investigation, 
um, but there's a policy aggregate limit of one million dollars. If you spend all that million dollars on the failure of the network security protection, there may be nothing left for the regulatory investigation. And uh, particularly also when you get over to the first party and the expense related portions of the policy, again, likely to be different limits of liability that are applicable to each of those coverage. So you want to know and understand what those are and how they interact with an overall policy aggregate limit to understand when and if you might run out of coverage. Um, the, the, the next slide here, the major exclusions. The, the real, I'm not going to run through each, each of these major exclusions. And, and the real point here, again, is that, um, number one, cyber liability policies are somewhat in their infancy, uh, you know, at least in the grand scheme of things in the insurance world. These policies have probably been around for you know, a decade or so, maybe a little bit longer. But they've really only started to see significant uptake where companies are buying them probably in the last four to five years. And so, number one, there hasn't been much litigation around the scope of the coverage under these policies. And all of the companies out there that are writing these, again, they're writing them, they, they each write their own policy, no standardization. Um, the way they describe what is covered, what's excluded under the policy, they use different terms, and um, so you need to, one of the questions at least that should be asked is, uh, of your risk managers and such, is at least what are our major um, or most significant exclusions that are contained in the policy? And then on the back side of that, I think the thing to always keep in mind also is, um, since these policies aren't standardized, they're typically highly negotiable. And um, if you bring in someone like uh, a Kevin or a Ross from Aon, a very good broker, um, if you bring in a good attorney who understands these, these policies and has dealt with them, these policies can be negotiated. Um, and in order to broaden the coverage, get rid of some of the exclusions that may have a particular impact on your business. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Kevin. So what we thought we'd do for the last few slides is to leave you with a few tips, takeaways that you can advise to your board of directors. So in this slide, the tip is that there is ample capacity, ample insurance limits available, except for the largest of entities. The pricing is for small companies, um, as low as $2,500 to $5,000 per million dollars of coverage and can increase for larger companies in the amount of $25,000 to $50,000 uh, per million dollars of coverage. So the question is, is that too much uh, compared to what the exposure is? And what we would advise you to have the Board of Directors consider is what is the value of their property, plant, and equipment, the traditional type of um, property valuation compared to what the value is of their technology and their information assets. Referring back to the 10Ks, if you look at the publicly available information, there's an increase in the emphasis on the value of information assets and technology. Then after comparing the values, compare the exposures. What are the exposures of the property compared to cyber? Again, what is the percentage chance that a building is going to burn down and have a total loss? How often does that happen? It's a very small percentage of the time. What is the, what is the percentage chance that there could be a cyber incident that could disrupt your supply chain, slow down your uh, distribution channel, or uh, gain unauthorized access to personally identifiable information? Then you want to quantify those in terms of how they could affect your financial statement and compare what the spend is in the total limits on the property and casualty insurance compared to what the spend is for the protections for the financial statement for the technology and information assets. Finally, we'd like to give you a, a, a few tips uh, for the Board of Directors that this is not solely an IT issue. Five, ten years ago, 
this was relegated to the IT security team um, and didn't include other departments that are critical to the analysis. First of all, entities must, much, must understand their unique technology and information assets. What are their unique exposures? Secondly, you work with your in-house and outside attorneys to mitigate the risk contractually, especially if you're using outside third-party providers, you want to allocate the risk appropriately and even require that outside third-party provider to have insurance that covers you in case the third-party provider makes a mistake that affects your uh, entity. Finally, you want to do an enterprise risk management analysis to what the cost benefit is. So for instance, you could throw up your hand and say, are these risks so extreme that we should be avoiding um, taking on some of this new technology or information assets. You want to balance the benefit for increase in sales and decrease in costs for implementing the technology versus the potential exposure. And you want to do that at the high level board of directors um, situation. Otherwise, your entity could be facing those shareholder derivative lawsuits against your D's and O's. Ethan? Thanks, Kevin. And um, at this point, we're going to open it up for questions. I see we have a couple here. And uh, if anyone else has any questions, you certainly should feel free to type them in to the uh, Q&A section on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Um, Kevin, there was one here for you that I, I think you may have hit on this really somewhat with the last slide, but maybe you want to expand on it a little bit. Um, the, the question is that you observed that risk can improve risk management. And can you expand on why and the steps to take to ensure it mitigates and doesn't magnify the risk? Sure. Um, entities are measured by how they um, are profitable compared to their peers. And it's quite clear that embracing technology can increase your productivity. And so you need to measure the increase in productivity versus that risk. And so the answer can't be the ostrich approach of putting the head in the stand. It's got to be embracing uh, the technology on an enterprise level in a logical, cultural manner that um, permeates throughout the entity. That means training your employees to what they should have access to and what they shouldn't have access to. That means doing background checks. That means if there's a policy to check with attorneys for, for sales on a contract, then check with the uh, attorneys. So again, it's not just the IT security issue to prevent it. It's much more of a cultural issue that must um, embrace each of the different groups in your entity. Thanks, Kevin. And the, the other question I'm seeing here, and I think this somewhat overlaps with uh, the last one as well, is uh, given the ongoing size and complexity of data protection versus successful breaches, uh, does one have to begin to plan for the eventual loss of Internet commerce and a return to pre-Internet ways of doing business? Any thoughts if on you that? Take, yeah, if you take a look at the Forrester and Gartner Group, um, the, the entities that, that do the surveys and then make the predictions about what um, the way the direction the economy is going, um, they have estimated that there's more data aggregated in the last two years than in the entire history of mankind um, prior to the last two years, and that that, um, that pace is going to increase exponentially uh, because of big data analytics. So it will actually be, uh, it's a good question, but it's going to be the opposite. It's going to be embraced more and more, uh, more usage of the Internet, but it's going to be thoughtful use of the Internet, thoughtful use of social media thoughtful use of cloud computing, thoughtful use of mobile communications, have a good bring your own device policy, thoughtful um, use of each of these uh, embracing of the technology that is going to make the difference. Remember, for board of directors and for management, the liability does not depend upon whether they have made the perfect right decision. The liability more depends upon have they taken the appropriate steps have they followed the right process and considered all of these issues? That, those are the key issues that management and board of directors have to consider. Thanks, Kevin. And then I, uh, we got one more question here uh, that we can maybe hit on just real quick, and that is 
Uh, are we aware of any industry captives considering offering this type of insurance? Um, I can give you a couple of thoughts on that. Um, I don't know about industry captives. Um, I have had a couple of clients who have inquired and looked a little bit, and I'm assuming this is, is looking at the cyber uh, liability type coverage. I, I've had a couple of clients who have looked at it a little bit. They've not gone far down the path. Um, really, some of the uh, constraints on that right now, I think, are uh, just the lack of data and getting your arms around um, the potential losses that arise from this. And so people are having a hard time getting comfortable with the concept of putting it into a captive uh, just because of the you know, somewhat hard to predict risk that you're actually putting in there. I don't, Kev, Kevin or Ross, do you guys have additional thoughts on that? Yeah, so we, right now we have nine different entities that use a captive for their cyber insurance. Of the nine, though, five of the nine are using it um, for the retention only part, and so they uh, self-insure the retention um, through the use of the captive as a tax-efficient um, mechanism. The other four um, use it as more of a uh, risk transfer but more of a control mechanism where they can control the wording. So Ethan and Russ... Uh, both pointed out that the negotiation of the wording is key to these policies. The base wording typically will have material exclusions. So what those other four entities out of the nine that put it in the captive is, they wrote their own policies. They put their own wording in of what would be included in the uh, coverage. And that, then you can expand it to include patent infringement, antitrust, um, all the fines and penalties um, that you might want to consider. However, of those four that put in the captive that were not the retention, that use it for risk transfer, only two of them got it reinsured. So two of them um, uh, are self-insuring that captive, whereas two of them actually reinsure out the um, risk to uh, insurance companies and reinsurers through the captive. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, it, you know, we're, we're now just a little bit past the, the top of the hour, and um, if anyone has questions, uh, the contact information for myself as well as Kevin and Ross is uh, contained on this uh, last slide. Feel free to contact us, drop us an email, give us a call. Happy to talk with you. Um, actually, I see my phone number. Uh, it's actually 5835 as opposed to 5320, um, but feel free to call, drop us an email, and uh, we will try and get an answer for you. And thanks, everyone, for participating. Ethan, I have a couple more announcements that I just want to um, go over with everybody. So thanks again for attending. Uh, please mark your calendars for the final session of our 2014 NDI Checkpoint Web Conference. Uh, it's on December 3rd, and it will focus on the um, upcoming proxy season. Uh, and don't forget, those seeking Kansas, New York, and their New Jersey CLE credit are required to complete the attorney affirmation form and email that to jbarts at foley.com. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation and ask that you please take 30 seconds to participate in a brief online survey. Uh, it's important for us to get your feedback, uh, and it helps us shape the programs going forward. So thanks again, and we will talk to you on December Third. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for your participation.